Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our weekly briefing. Uh, we have some great folks from around the city with us this morning, and then I have a number of things to share. Um, today, we're joined, as usual, by public health. We'll also be hearing uh, from our community development division and our traffic engineering department. So we'll start, as always, with Janelle Heinrich, who's the director of public health, Madison, Dane County. Good morning, everyone. We'll start this morning with a little data, as, we, as I usually do. As of today, we have surpassed 12,000 cases of COVID in Dane County. We'll release a snapshot this afternoon with the latest data, but I have a few details I can share now. Our 14-day average without the University of Wisconsin is now about 122 cases per day. With the university, it's 136 cases per day. A week ago, I was here before you and was able to indicate at that time we were going down. Our trend line was going down. Unfortunately, in the past week, we have seen our cases increasing. The number affiliated with the University of Wisconsin is now only 11% of our total cases in Dane County. The 18 to 22 year old age group is no longer the one with the most cases. The ages 23 to 29 and 30 to 39 now have the most cases. We have seen a significant increase of about 25% in all ages outside of the 18 to 22 year old age group. And right now, there are 66 people hospitalized with COVID in Dane County, which is a de decrease for the first time in about 10 days, down from our peak of 78 two days ago. And with the exception of those under 19, in the last two weeks, we have seen hospitalizations in every single age group. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the Align Energy Center and testing that's happening there. We're continuing to see high demand at the Alliant Energy Center. In addition to the demand this week, uh, the State Department of Health Services registration tool called COVID Connect has been experiencing problems, which has caused some significant delays. We're learning how to work with that and are making adjustments, but I want to remind you that if you have symptoms or have been exposed and have a healthcare provider, please try calling your doctor to see if you can get tested there. We're also hearing about more people who are being required by their employer to get tested. We do not recommend requiring employees to have a negative test before coming to work for any reason. One of which is people with COVID-19 may have positive test results for weeks after they recover but are not contagious after they have met certain criteria. Requiring a negative test places an unnecessary burden on the employee and may prevent you from providing services due to extended employee absences. So if you haven't heard from us, uh, please do not require your employees to be tested before they come back to work. As I said last week, we recommend testing for people who have had close contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19, people who have symptoms, people who have regular exposure to a large number of people, and who or who work with high-risk populations. Though there have been challenges at the AEC uh, COVID test site, the flu clinic is unaffected. It, um, we are changing the entrance for the flu clinic at the Alliant Energy Center tomorrow so that it will not be impacted by any challenges or delays that the, the COVID test site may be experiencing. So starting tomorrow, there will be an entrance for the flu clinic, media, and staff off of Olin Avenue. As a reminder, this clinic is for Dane County adults and children six months and older who do not have insurance, and Dane County children six months through 18 years who have Badger Care or Medicaid. The average wait time for getting a flu shot has been less than five minutes, and to date, we have immunized about 345 people for flu at the Alliant Energy Center. I know we are all fatigued by this pandemic. As the weather changes, we naturally spend more time inside. Week after week through this pandemic, the majority of people who have tested positive for COVID have informed our contact tracers that they have had close contact with someone who has also tested positive. 
And in the past two weeks, one third of all individuals who have received a positive diagnosis have indicated that they have attended some sort of gathering or party. Please, as the weather changes and in general, think differently about how you gather socially. I know that's so very important to all of us, but we need to find ways to do that outside and continue to wear your mask, stay six feet apart, and stay home if you are sick or just feel a little off. Let's do all do our part to change the tra trajectory of COVID in Dane County. Thank you. Thank you, Janelle, and I'll just add my request as well to please, please keep wearing your masks, keep that six foot distance away from folks that aren't in your household and wash your hands. It is so important for not only our own health individually, but the health of our entire community. Next, we're gonna hear from Lynette Rhodes from the Community Development Division to talk about our new Financial Navigator program. Hello, I'm here because we're excited to announce the launch of a new city service, the Financial Resources Hotline. This hotline will provide guidance over the phone to residents dealing with income loss due to COVID-19. Trained financial navigators are available to help residents address a variety of financial issues. We have listed a few here on the PowerPoint we'll be sharing with the media. But in summary, the navigators can explain resources in the community to help, such as bill paying assistance, government benefits, and other programs that may come from future stimulus packages. To access the hotline, residents can visit the City of Madison website, conveniently labeled cityofmadison.com backslash financial hotline to fill out a short interest form. To get assistance filling out that form, a person can also call our library resource line. A helpful library resource line worker can complete the interest form over the phone for you. Once the form is done, an individual will be contacted within 48 hours, Monday through Friday, by a financial navigator to begin a one-on-one -on -one session. Hotline sessions will last about 30 minutes and address residents' most pressing needs. Organizations across Madison can also refer clients directly to financial navigators by sharing the link or helping them fill out the form directly. Financial navigation sessions are available in English, Hmong, Spanish, and other languages available through the city's interpretation services. We are operating this program with the support of the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund. Madison was one of the first groups, city, one of the first group of cities to receive a grant from the Financial Navigators program this year. To date, about 31 municipalities across the country are participating in this program. The 80,000 a year grant provides operating support and access to up-to-date pandemic-related policy information and resources. The city has committed to operate this hotline for one year with the possibility of continuing services if the need remains. The Financial Resources Hotline is being led by the city's Community Development Division in partnership with Madison Public Library. If anyone has questions about the program, I'll be available for questions or they can contact the City of Madison's Community Development Division. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette, and thank you to everyone who's worked so hard to make this service a reality uh, here in Madison. I'm very pleased that we can offer this to anyone, any resident in Madison that needs it. Next, we're gonna hear from Yang Tao, our traffic engineer, um, and who will be bringing us more information about Walktober. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to quickly uh, go through a couple of items. Uh, first, a quick update on our October uh, event. Uh, Mayor Sacha uh, gave a really good uh, overview of the event last week. So this is just a reminder to our residents that uh, it's a uh, continuous event for the whole month. And there's a lot of activities 
we would like to see continued participation from our residents. Uh, also, individuals can uh, participate and uh, log their uh, activities and send a form to us to win prizes. Uh, families and the schools can also participate uh, for uh, the walk or wheel challenge. The Madison Par uh, Public Library has put together a special uh, reading list for those who love walking and reading, so please check that out. Uh, Madison Parks also uh, put some program for folks who love to walk and enjoy our beautiful parks and also help to some cleaning. So uh, each week we are posting fresh walking ideas uh, on our website, so uh, for, please check it, check it out. Uh, last week, uh, the theme was uh, nature walks. Uh, this week, we are focusing on arts, so we are proposing uh, a few routes uh, to help you to look at the city's beautiful uh, art installations, such as murals, uh, also uh, the arts that turned the uh, electronic boxes on the streets from eyesore to actually something very interesting. And also we're featuring uh, the newly installed physical distancing arts at many locations throughout the city. Uh, next week, uh, the focus will be on history, and the week of 20, October 25th will be on neighborhood walks. Uh, I want to stress that one because we really want to encourage the neighbors to explore their neighborhood and let us know if there's anything they say that uh, needs improvement. Uh, Traffic engineering has various programs to help make uh, all the neighborhoods more walkable, uh, more safe, and uh, more comfortable. So um, we want uh, our residents to be aware of the program and uh, have the resource to contact us uh, if they see any improvements. So we hope to work together with the neighbors to make our community uh, safe and a uh, pleasant place to walk. Uh, please also uh, uh, be mindful about the social distancing and other safety measures for COVID-19 uh, when you participate in the program. More information can be found on our website. Today is also a very special day. Um, Mayor Sacha and the Common Council has uh, proclaimed today as the White Cane Safety Day in Madison. Uh, to mainly promote awareness of uh, the safety of the pedestrians who have uh, vision impairments. Uh, we also, uh, from, a, from a recent survey, we also found uh, um, there are still some challenges uh, for the public to be aware of uh, the Wisconsin White Cane Law, which requires motorists to come to a full stop before approaching closer than 10 feet to a pedestrian who use a white cane or a service animal. So we want to uh, promote awareness of that and improve the safety for our uh, vision impaired residents and uh, visitors. The city has been doing a good job incorporating accessible, accessible features in its transportation infrastructure, uh, you know, such as the disabled warning fields and many critical locations. And you know, one thing to feature is that uh, we have also been recognized a national leader in providing accessible pedestrian signals. Um, those uh, uh, devices are showing uh, uh, on the print, PowerPoint presentation and we can share uh, uh, with the media afterwards. Uh, but what those does is that uh, it helps the vis visually impaired uh, users to locate the push buttons and also inform them when it's uh, a product across the street. Uh, we typically use them at uh, uh, signalized locations, uh, which have provided a constant locator tone, and also when, bush, when push button is activated and when the walk face is on, it provides uh, uh, audible message and also vibrating surface to convey the message to users uh, non-visually. Uh, uh, something very new, we also started uh, to implement this, um, the critical uh, locations such as uh, pedestrian flashing beacons, uh, that has been uh, the first in the state, and not many uh, places have that yet. And uh, we are working uh, on making those, more of those available. We also appreciate the collaboration uh, and the partnership 
uh, with Wisconsin Council of the Blind and Visually uh, Impaired. Uh, we have uh, frequently consulted them and working together to make those safety improvements uh, for those users. So the city encourages uh, our residents and the visitors to actively participate uh, in creating a safe and inclusive community for people with disabilities. Uh, so for more information, please uh, uh, visit the website listed below. And specifically, uh, for residents who need uh, uh, the accommodation of uh, accessible pedestrian signals, uh, please contact traffic engineering uh, by using the kind of information listed on the slide. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Yang, and I hope that folks um, will get outside and take advantage of Walktober. A uh, beautiful day today to get outside and walk a little bit. Uh, I have a number of things to go through today, starting with an election update. I am very excited to announce the following voting numbers for the city of Madison. As of yesterday, the clerk's office has issued 100,095 absentee ballots in the city of Madison. That is a new milestone for our city. 65,166 have already been returned and will be counted on election day. We have 189,933 registered voters in the city of Madison, including over 28,000 that registered or updated their registration since the August primary. These numbers are amazing, but I wanna make sure that they include you. There are lots of chances for you to still get registered to vote and to request an absentee ballot. Uh, and we are coming up on early voting. And of course, you can register and vote on November 3rd at your polling place. All the information you need is at cityofmadison.com slash clerk. That's cityofmadison.com slash clerk. And again, I wanna congratulate all of the voters who have gotten, requested their absentees. Um, that is really a new record uh, for the city of Madison. Speaking of being counted, uh, unfortunately, the deadline to fill out the 2020 census has been moved up to 4.59 a.m. on October 16th, which is tomorrow morning. Please, if you haven't already, visit my2020census.gov or call 844-330-2020 to make sure that your household is counted. I wanna come back to voting for a minute um, and talk about a few ways that the clerk's office is making voting accessible. The clerk uh, and the entire city are determined to make voting accessible for all eligible voters. Uh, so poll workers at each polling place use the Disability Rights Wisconsin polling place checklist on election morning to verify accessibility. Um, if anyone notices any barriers, uh, we encourage you to contact the clerk's office as soon as possible so the issue can be addressed. Voting will also be available curbside uh, for voters who find it difficult to get into the polling place. Poll workers will have bright yellow safety vests near the entrance of each polling place to assist voters with curbside voting. Voters who are unable to sign or make their mark in the poll book due to a physical disability are exempt from that requirement. And all a voter needs to do is indicate that, that, that they are exempt because of a disability. Each City of Madison polling place will have an express vote machine um, and all of our in-person absentee voting sites will also have express votes machines uh, which allow voters to mark a ballot using a braille keypad or a touch screen with large print and high contrast options. Um, and these machines are also compatible with SIP and PUF devices. Um, this ballot marking device is available to all eligible voters. Voters may choose anyone to assist them in physically marking their ballot if they need help. The only rules are that the assistant may not be the voter's employer or union agent. 
Voters may request that the clerk's office provide them with a braille ballot in advance, either as absentee or as a ballot at your polling place. We just need that advance notice to make sure that we print it. Voters who are seeking more information about this option can contact the clerk's office at 608-266-4601 or email voting at cityofmadison.com. And any voters who are indefinitely confined to their home due to disability or age may request absentee ballots for all elections. Uh, you can do this through myvote.wi.gov. Again, I want to emphasize that voting is safe, secure, and healthy for everyone in the city of Madison. Next, I want to talk a little bit more about traffic safety. Um, at, as of Monday, October 12th, we moved to the next stage of our speed changes in our citywide Vision Zero initiative. The posted speed limit on Milwaukee Street from just east of Fair Oaks Ave to Thompson Drive will change from 35 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour. Similar to the recent East Washington changes, digital signboards will be temporarily placed in the area to remind drivers of the speed limit changes. In the last five years, there have been nine people seriously injured in traffic crashes on Milwaukee Street. Two people were injured while walking across Milwaukee Street. Lowering, this, lowering the speed that people are driving is a key factor in changing the severity of the outcome of a crash. Vision Zero is a data-driven strategy that is intended to eliminate traffic deaths and severe injuries on city streets by 2030, while increasing safe, healthy, and equitable mobility for all. For more information about Vision Zero and to sign up for Vision Zero news updates, please see www.cityofmadison.com slash vision zero, all spelled out. Turning now to affordable housing, this week I introduced proposals to direct almost $8 million to homeless services, rapid rehousing, and new affordable housing construction. This comes in a series of resolutions. The first resolution commits $2 million to emergency shelters for homeless individuals and rapid rehousing support to connect individuals and families with housing options. The city is working in partnership with the Dane County Continuum of Care, and uh, we have prioritized these federal emergency solutions grant funds to connect people with housing. During this public health emergency, we must bring people experiencing homelessness inside to safe, supportive housing as quickly as possible. We know that many local property owners are struggling to find renters and pay mortgages amid the, amid the coronavirus pandemic. By bringing resources to bear through rapid rehousing programs, we have an opportunity to partner in ways that can benefit both property owners with unleased apartments and those needing housing. The Rapid Rehousing Program supports households with both rent assistance and case management services, but they are struggling to find available housing units in our community. I am calling on landlords with vacant unit, units to work with us to make them available for people who need housing. Landlords who are looking to fill units and to be a partner in this program are encouraged to contact the Catholic Charities Housing Navigation Services at housingnavigation at ccmadison.org or to call 608-826-8093. I really want to emphasize we need landlords to partner with us and this can be a win-win for landlords and residents and our entire community. The second resolution introduced provides almost $6 million from the city's affordable housing fund that will help finance the construction of over 320 units of quality housing in the city. We will award these funds to five proposals that will apply to WIDA for allocations of low-income housing tax credits. We have valued our partnership with WIDA over the years and hope to continue this partnership for years to come. 
In addition to these five proposals, we are also going to commit affordable housing funds to proposals from nonprofit applications that will not be applying for tax credits. This is an additional allocation of affordable housing funds, and it will further the city's goal of creating quality affordable housing for Madison's residents while supporting community-based nonprofit organizations in fulfilling their missions. This group of proposals carries two added features that the Common Council and I have prioritized. A longer period of affordability, 40 years versus 30 years, and enhanced sustainability and energy efficiency measures. Creating affordable housing is one of the top priorities of my administration. These resolutions, which will be voted on at the October 20th Common Council meeting, are moving us in the right direction. Another priority for my administration is rapid transit here in the city of Madison. And so I'm pleased to remind folks that our uh, planning for the east-west bus rapid transit line continues. Uh, there is a kickoff meeting on October 22nd uh, for the east-west BRT planning study. Uh, it will happen from 6 to 8 p.m. You can visit madisonbrt.com to access the Zoom link. And I encourage folks to join that meeting again on the 22nd from 6 to 8 p.m. to learn about the next phase of the East-West BRT planning study and project development. Uh, we'll review the progress to date, learn about the process and outcomes, and you'll have a chance to share your perspective on BRT routes, station design, the service plan, and the economic development impacts. Uh, we'll also cover improvements to the existing north-south metro routes. I also want to remind folks that raking season has begun um, and our new yard waste schedule began this week. All Madison residents have assigned days uh, where they should set out their leaves for pickup uh, this fall. And you can get the schedule for your home at the Streets Division website, cityofmadison.com slash yard waste. If you don't have internet access or have trouble with the online schedule, you can contact the Streets Division office that services your home to receive the set-out dates. If you live east of South Park Street, including the Isthmus, you should call 608-246-4532. If you live west of South Park Street, you should call 608-266-4681. On the Yard Waste website, you can enter your address, um, it will show you three dates that were all, will all be Sundays. You should get your yard waste out on or by the dates shown, and then crews will come through the following week and collect leaves and yard waste from your neighborhood. Um, for example, if you set out uh, your if your set out date is Sunday, October 25th, that means you should get your yard waste out on October 25th, and the crews the crews will come through your neighborhood between Monday the 26th, and Friday the 30th. I did this this past weekend, uh, checked my dates, put them in my calendar, raked my leaves, got them out on the terrace, uh, not in the gutter, but on the terrace, and lo and behold, the crews came through on the Monday and cleaned them right up for us. So I appreciate the Streets Division for making this clearer and easier for folks to understand when they should put their leaves out. And please, do rake the leaves out of the street. We want to love our lakes, not leaf them. Finally, as I always do, I want to highlight some community resources that are available to families in need. Our housing helpline is 608-264-0549, or you can email housinginfo at cityofmadison.com. If you need help with internet or phone service, call the Public Service Commission at 608-267-3595. If you need help finding child care, call 608-216-7022. And for all of these issues and more, including how to access food resources, you can call United Ways 211 or text your zip code to 898-211. All of these resources and more are posted at cityofmadison.com. Just click on the community resources link. And last but certainly not least, upcoming meetings this next week. Today at 1, the Sustainable Madison Committee meets. At 4, the Monona Terrace Community and Convention Center Board meets. At 4.30, the Finance Committee will meet. At 5, the Equal Opportunities Commission. Also at 5, the Landlord and Tenant Issues Committee. And at 5.30, the Downtown Coordinating Committee. 
on Friday the 16th at 11 a.m., the Homeless Services Consortium Board of Directors meets. On Monday the 19th at 5 p.m., the Transportation Policy and Planning Board meets. At 5.30, Plan Commission. And at 6.30, the City County Homeless Issues Committee. On Tuesday the 20th, at 4.30, the Police and Fire Commission meets. At 4.30, the Common Council Executive Committee meets. And at 6.30, the Common Council will meet. And on Wednesday, the 21st, the, at 5.30 p.m., the Alcohol License Review Committee will meet. All of these meetings are virtual. Uh, information about all of those meetings and more is available on the city's website, cityofmadison.com. All right, that's it for what I have. I think we have some questions and uh, perhaps a little bit of time to take them. All right. Good morning, Mayor. Um, all the questions today are for you. Okay. <laughs> um, the first question is regarding the police chief search, and it says, where do things stand with um, the search for a new police chief? In early July, you called um, on the police and fire commission to make a selection within 90 days. It is now 95 days. Are you frustrated by the lack of action on this? And are we any closer to having a new chief? Well, thank you for the question. It has been over, substantially over a year since Chief Koval retired. Um, and I do think that that is far too long for us to be without a permanent police chief. Um, however, I realized there was a pandemic uh, that intervened and that the Police and Fire Commission is now working, um, I think, as quickly as they can to appoint a new police chief. I understand that they have received um, applications for the position and they are, they've, those have been screened and they are reviewing them now. Um, and I am hopeful that they will move expeditiously to choose someone uh, or rather to choose a set of folks to interview in person, um, including having opportunities for the community to interact with finalists. Um, I still hope that we can get someone chosen by the end of the year. Um, so that they can start as soon as possible. I think we really do need to have a permanent police chief. Um, the next set of questions relates to the 2020 census. It says, uh, what is your reaction to the U.S. Supreme Court's decision on the census? Are you worried this will lead to an inaccurate count? And is the city making last-minute push to help underserved communities file their paperwork? Uh, another excellent question. Thank you. Um, so, yes, I am concerned by this ruling. I think it's really unfortunate um, and see it uh, really as a partisan push to um, interfere with the census's ability to do not just a complete count, um, but to do all of the things. Oh, it seems the lights have gone off. Um, to do all of the things that they need to do to make sure that the um, that the count is uh, verified and the data are processed correctly. Uh, I understand that many households have already been counted, and I appreciate that, uh, but the folks that are hardest to count uh, are likely the folks that are, remain uncounted at this point in time. And so, yes, the city is still asking folks, as you heard earlier, to please go to my2020census.com uh, or to call... 844-330-2020 and make sure that your household is counted. We also um, have been partnering with community groups throughout the entire process of the census count, um, and I want to thank those partners. They've done a tremendous job to make sure that we're reaching out to um, the hard-to-count parts of our community. In fact, um, the Latino Chamber and Freedom, Inc. were planning a census couch party for this Friday. They scrambled and moved it up to last night, so thank you for doing that. Um, we're also publicizing the new deadline on neighborhood listservs and social media. I want to thank, in particular, the Alders who have shared this with their blogs and listservs. Um, and we've been partnering uh, with all sorts of folks, including the library and UW and the bid on mobile census sites where we can help folks uh, understand how to fill out the census. Um, also, we partnered with the Urban League to put up a banner on Park Street um, and encourage people to fill out the census. And again, folks do have until um, very, very early tomorrow morning to fill out the census if they haven't done so yet. Sorry. 
The last question is on Halloween. It says, what does the city of Madison plan to do about trick-or-treating? Will there be official trick-or-treating hours and guidelines, or is the city counseling the activity due to the pandemic? I'm going to defer this question to Janelle from Public Health to answer. At this point, we're not recommending that we cancel Halloween. It's one of the activities that we can do outside, but we're asking people to modify your approach. Um, we have information on our website about it. Uh, we're asking you to not go with people that you don't live with, to not come in within six feet of people, and to stick to your own neighborhood and wear your face covering. And then we have some tips and tricks on our website for you to think about how to deliver that candy differently and to please not have a party. Um, I know that this is hard for all of us. I have kids of different ages that enjoy the hot, that, this, this fun night as well, but we have to do it in ways that protect our health. So thank you. Thank you, Janelle. All right, any other questions? That's it for today, Mayor. Okay, well, thank you all very much for tuning in, and we will see you next week.